Bibles with us tonight to the 14th chapter of the Gospel according to John. If I had asked you to open your Bibles to your favorite chapter, some of you would have opened to Romans 8. Others would have opened probably to Ephesians 1. Some might have opened your Bibles to John 17. But I believe there would have been some who would have opened their Bibles to John chapter 14. We're not going to read the entire chapter. I'm speaking to you tonight from the 27th verse. When our Lord said to his disciples on the eve of his departure from their presence, having come into the world for the express purpose of going to Calvary, he said, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart trouble, neither let it be afraid. Several things are mentioned in this chapter of the gospel according to John that are of great interest to every Christian. It has been suggested in, the, in these verses we have comfort, we have permanence, we have preparation, we have reception, and finally we have certainty. Those are great truths that are expressed by our Lord in his last words to the disciples before his death. But tonight we're looking only at verse 27. When our Lord gave to his disciples the assurance they needed to hear. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. There is a twofold peace that Jesus Christ gives. Just as there is a twofold joy expressed in the 11th verse, which is the fruit of the peace that Christ gives to his own. Let's compare these two verses for just a moment by way of introduction to our study. Looking at chapter 15 and verse 11, our Lord said, These things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. First of all, he makes reference to his joy, and secondly, to the joy of the disciples. My joy certainly refers to the Lord Jesus being the author and giver of true joy. Our joy is the fruit of sanctification. His joy is the fruit of justification, and our joy is the fruit of sanctification. Now going back to peace in verse 27 of chapter 14, we might say that we have first of all the peace of justification, therefore being justified by faith we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, Romans 5 verse 1. That's the peace of justification. And then we have the peace of sanctification, and that's given us in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 7. The peace of justification has to do with our standing in Christ. And the peace of God expressed by Paul in his letter to the Philippian saints has reference to the peace of sanctification. So one is the fruit of justification and the other is the fruit of sanctification. There are wrong ideas being propagated about peace which lead men and women into delusion 
and disappointment. There is much false peace today, and I'm not thinking now primarily about the persons who are preaching peace, peace when there is no peace. But I'm talking about false peace among individuals who claim to know Jesus Christ, whom to know is life eternal. There is much false peace. I'd like for us to discuss that subject. Tonight we want to see what peace is not and what peace really is. First of all, peace is not impassivity. It is not a negative quality. It is not a condition of mind in which one is completely unaffected by happenings and circumstances. That is not peace. One may go into the hospital ward and see a person dying. There seems to be no pain, no struggling. The man lies in a state of coma. And someone standing by, a relative no doubt, would say, he or she is so peaceful. Beloved, that's not peace. That's not peace at all. So peace is not impassivity. When you go into a hospital or you visit someone who is dying... And someone says, oh, how peaceful. That is not an illustration of peace. Far from it. When you see someone dying, it could be said that it is the stupor of drug faculties. It is the unintelligent void of unconsciousness. It is the morbid insensibility of disease. But it's not peace. So many a godless man brags about he has no worry whatsoever about his sins. Does this mean that he has peace? Absolutely not. It simply shows that in a spiritual sense, he is a corpse. Peace is not the absence of disturbance. It is rather the presence of an assurance in the heart because of conviction brought about as a result of knowing Christ as Savior and having been tutored in the great truths of his precious word. Therefore, peace is not impassivity. Peace is not the suppression of one's natural feelings, the artificial deadening of one's human sensibilities is not peace. Peace is not placidity. It is not the glassy smoothness of still water. And that is no illustration at all of peace. Peace has to do with the depths, not just the surface. I can remember years ago, my wife and I were making a trip. In fact, we were on the way to the state of Washington to preach. I had been invited out to preach in uh, Kennewick, Washington, by a friend of mine who had been pastor in Houston for a number of years. And being in a church that was a real problem, and me being quite young, I have to confess, I would have liked to have had a way of escape. And of course, you've never been in that position. And so my friend called me and he said, Bill, he was pastor at Richland, Washington. And at Richland, uh, that's where they had the large atomic energy plant on the Columbia River. So Brother Collins uh, was his name, and he said, I want you to come out. I want you to preach. The church at Kennewick is without a pastor. And take your vacation and come out. Well, <laughs> I was about ready for vacation. So... Uh, we drove out to Kennewick, Washington, and I preached uh, several times before the people in the First Baptist Church at Kennewick, Washington. On the way out, we went through uh, some very scenic places. We went through uh, Yellowstone National Park. We went uh, through what is called Jackson Hole and the Great Tetons. 
And I'll never forget, we spent all night one night in Lake Jackson, uh, Jackson Hole. And then the next morning when we got up, we went by this beautiful lake that was right at the very foothills of the Teton Mountains. A beautiful sight. The water was so smooth that morning, huge lake. It was as placid as a mirror. But, beloved, peace is not placidity. You never know what is going on beneath the surface. Many times you and I may drive down to Galveston, and we may see the waters rather smooth. The waves are not very high. But if you go out very far, there can be really a raging beneath the surface of the waters. Thus, we can see individuals who have the appearance of being rather placid. Someone might say, that's a good illustration of a person who really possesses peace, but yet one does not know what is really going on within the depths of that individual. He may appear to be placid and to be peaceful when in reality there is an internal war going on that one does not know about. It is kept concealed. So peace is not placidity. It is not the glassy smoothness of still water. So it has to do with the depths and not just with the surface of things. Many a man contrives a placid exterior while his bosom inwardly bleeds with a civil war. Again, peace is a matter not of our emotions, but of convictions. I said not a matter of emotions, but of convictions. In these days, opinions have taken the place of convictions. And we need to think about this for a moment. We are living in an age when people as a whole are opinionated and they're ready and willing to express their opinions. But we find very few individuals who have convictions with any foundation whatsoever. So peace is a matter not of our emotions but of our convictions. Therefore, in these days when opinions are being expressed and very little is being stated that will manifest any real conviction based on the truth of God's Word, we can see why there is so little peace and so much restlessness even in the churches of today. I'm asking you a personal question. Is there real peace in your own heart and life? That's a good question that each one of us has to ask himself. It is said that a man will argue for his opinions, but he'll die for his convictions. I like what Sir Robert Anderson said, a man after whom I have read a great deal in times past. He makes this statement, and I think it's a great statement, quote, Opinions are our own and should not be too firmly held. Truth is divine and is worth dying for, end of quote. That's a great statement. So men will argue for their opinions. But people who are anchored in the truth of God's Word, who have real convictions based on truth, are ready to die for their convictions that are based on the infallible Word of the living God. Some time ago, I saw the title of a message at a so-called church here in the city of Houston under the caption, quote, Tolerance is the manifestation of conviction, end of quote. That was the subject. Now think about it for a moment. Tolerance is the manifestation of conviction, is it? Well, first thing I wanted to do is to see what Webster had to say about tolerance. I didn't want to trust my judgment, so, but well, I'll just look it up. Tolerance, according to Webster, is freedom from bigotry of, or from racial or religious prejudice. 
the capacity for endurance. A legally permissible variation from the standard of weight to concede as the right to opinions or participation, the recognition of the rights of the individual to his own opinions and customs as in matters pertaining to religious worship, end of quote. What do you think about tolerance? Well, let's go through the scriptures for a moment. Did Jesus Christ manifest tolerance in John 3, 3 and 5? He said, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Except a man be born again, he cannot enter the kingdom. He did not manifest any tolerance. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. No tolerance there, beloved. No room for opinion. A plain statement of fact that must be adhered to. Did Paul manifest tolerance and write into the Galatian church in Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 9? He said, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that call you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel which is not another. And if any person preaches anything contrary to you than that which I preached, let him be accursed. Even if an angel from heaven should declare any message contrary to what I've given, let him be accursed. In the fifth chapter of the same epistle in verse 12, Paul said, I would to God they were cut off who trouble you. No tolerance there. No tolerance there. Did Isaiah manifest tolerance when he said, Except they speak according to this word, there is no light in them. Isaiah 8 and verse 20. No tolerance there. Convictions are built on knowledge. Convictions are built on faith based on knowledge. Convictions are based on the assurance that comes through belief in the knowledge of the infallible word of the eternal God. And it is from these certainties of the soul that true peace comes. It is this which explains the wonderful peace of the Lord Jesus Christ. His peace was the inward rest which came from the perfect knowledge, perfect knowledge, absolutely perfect, and assurance which he had. When one studies closely John chapter 14 for the important subjects of deity, heaven, the future, and the present are all given us in this chapter of the gospel according to John. Let me illustrate. The chapter begins with a familiar expression to all of us. In my Father's house are many mansions. He had something to say about heaven. He not only had something to say about heaven, but he had something to say about deity. In the 10th verse, he said, I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. There, deity is expressed. And then he also said, I will come again and receive you unto myself. He spoke of the future. He not only spoke of the future, but now we come to our text. He also spoke of the present. My peace I give unto you. My peace I leave with you. So the Holy Spirit is to be with you and with me forever, according to the 26th verse. Now note the two words in our text tonight. The word, the verb I leave, or leave, and the verb give. Why the two verbs? The peace which Jesus Christ makes ours is both a bequeathment, something which a person leaves after his departure, and also a bestowment, and this is a direct impartation of his own life to his own. So there is a bequeathment and a bestowment. I think it was Henriksen who said, in giving his statement about the two verbs that are used here, a fiamme 
is the verb I leave, and didomy is the verb I give. And then it was Henriksen who said, and I quote, Peace is both a legacy and a treasure. Peace is both a legacy and a treasure. So we have both a bequeathment and also a bestowment. So Jesus Christ is not only with you and me, He is within you and me. Not only with you and me, but He is within you and me. So His message was bequeathed and His life was imparted. Now what about false peace? In Jeremiah chapter 8 and verse 11, the prophet spoke of those who promised peace when there was none. And in condemning the false prophets of his time, he said, For they have healed the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly, saying, Notice they've healed the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly, saying, Peace, peace. And then he said, when there is no peace. The Apostle Paul in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 3, giving one of the promises and one of the signs of the last times, told about those who will say peace and safety when sudden destruction will come upon them as a woman in travail. Isaiah says, There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. God may forbear the wicked a while, a while, and stop the roaring of his cannon. But though there be a truce, yet there is no peace. We all know what a human truth is, and a human truce is easily broken. They're made, and they're easily broken. They may be fearless and stupid, but there is a great difference between a stupefied conscience and a pacified conscience. You know, the devil gives peace. We find uh, in Luke chapter 11 and verse 21, when a strong man armed keepeth his palace, his goods are in peace. So the devil gives a false peace. And there are a lot of people today who are occupied with a false peace, who have no concept whatsoever of the peace which is the result of justification. And one must know and experience the peace of justification before he can ever experience the peace of God, which is the peace of sanctification. What are some of the signs of a false peace? Let's discuss this for a few minutes. Signs of a false peace are, first of all, a false peace has much confidence in it. A false peace has much confidence in it. But this confidence is conceit. How confident were the foolish virgins? Let's base this on Scripture. They took their lamp, and they took no oil. All trimmed their lamps. But don't forget the result and the outcome of that parable in Matthew chapter 25. So if false peace has confidence in it, but this confidence is nothing but mere human conceit. Secondly, False peace separates those things which God has joined together. I said false peace separates the things that God has joined together. God joins holiness and peace. So holiness of life and peace are joined together. Now here is an individual who says, Oh, I have peace. I'm at peace with God. And yet there is no evidence of a holy life. There is no evidence of a separated life. He's lying through his teeth. He doesn't really have peace. He's a deceived individual. He's putting on a front. He's a hypocrite. 
So false peace separates those things that God joins. And God joins holiness of life with peace. But he who has a false peace separates the two. Listen to Deuteronomy 29, 19. I shall have peace. Get this. I shall have peace though I walk in the imagination of my heart. Don't forget that verse. There is a verse that answers every question that might arise in the minds of individuals. So think about that text for a moment. I shall have peace, though I walk in the imagination of my heart. So the wicked are loose and vain, and yet thank God that they have peace. Think about the number of church members there are today who talk about peace, sing about peace, and yet there is no evidence of peace within. They're walking after the imaginations of their own minds. You might as well, one has said, suck health out of poison as peace out of sin. How do you like that one? You might as well suck health out of poison as peace out of sin. Thirdly, false peace is not willing to be tried. Now we're going to get down where a lot of church members live. And I trust we don't have any in this church family that can be put into this category. False peace is unwilling to be tried. It is a sign they are bad wares which will not endure the light of Holy Scripture. Someone has said a sign man has stolen goods is when he will not let someone search his house. I like that. You know, if I suspected someone in being a thief and having stolen something that belonged to me and I went to him, I had good evidence that he had stolen something that belonged to me. And he was not willing to talk about it. And then I sent the law and the law went and wanted to search his house, but he would not be willing to have his house searched. That's a mighty good sign that the person is a thief. Now let's turn that around a little. Do you mind to be tried? Do you object when someone asks you a question about your relationship to the Lord? You know, Peter counted it a great joy. He counted it a great privilege to be able to give a reason for the hope that was within him, 1 Peter 3.15. Do you object when anyone asks you about your relationship with the Lord? Now think with me for a moment. How many church members are there today? And no doubt you have friends and relatives who are so enamored with their particular denomination or their particular religious belief that they don't want anyone to come in and raise a question and question anything that they believe. They don't want to be tried. That's a good sign that an individual does not really have peace. When a person truly has peace, he doesn't mind anyone to question him. He is ready to give a hope, a reason for the hope that he has. He is ready to stand up and give his testimony as to what he believes concerning the person and work of Jesus Christ and all the great biblical truths related to the person and work of the Son of God. So a false peace cannot endure to be tried by the word of the eternal God. So false peace cannot endure trial. Now what is true peace? What is true peace? What did the Lord Jesus say to his disciples? Peace I leave with you. That's a legacy. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth. Give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. 
So true peace has the whole trinity for its author. Let's investigate this a little. Grace is the root, peace is the fruit, and peace is the fruit wherever grace reigns in the heart. I said the triune God, give to us the peace. First of all, God the Father is the author of peace. So God the Father is the God of peace. 1 Thessalonians 5, 23. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 33, and Philippians 4, and verse 9. God the Son is the purchaser of peace. Colossians 1, and verse 20. I don't know why this mistake is made so many times by ministers of the gospel, but I'd like you to turn with me to Colossians 1, and verse 20. Let's read that text, and then we'll... Give a few comments on it. A great text of Scripture, one familiar to most of us. And having made peace, having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. So God the Son is the purchaser of peace. The Father, God the Father is the God of peace, and God the Son is the purchaser of peace. I'll illustrate the point that I want to bring out. A woman lay dying. Her minister came in to visit her. She was asked the question if she had made peace with God. Her answer was no. No, she gave the correct answer. She had not made peace with God. Peace is something you and I do not make. Peace is something that has been purchased by Jesus Christ. He made peace by the blood of his cross, and that peace which he made by the blood of his cross becomes the believers as the fruit of of grace being imparted. So her answer was correct. No, I have not made peace with God. Jesus Christ made peace for me. And she quoted Colossians 1 and verse 20. How many times have you heard the statement, I've made peace with God? Many church members talk about having made peace with God. We don't make peace with God. We are the recipients of the peace made by Christ. Thirdly, we're talking about peace being the fruit or the work of the triune God. Peace is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Galatians 5 and verse 22. The Holy Spirit seals up peace to the conscience. He clears up the work of grace in the heart from whence arises a peace that passes all understanding. How shall we know that our, ours is a true peace? I raised some questions a few minutes ago and then sought to show what false peace is. Now how shall we be sure that our peace is genuine? that our peace is the fruit of the work of grace in our hearts. I'll give you three reasons. First of all, true peace flows from union with Christ. By being in Christ, we have peace. By believing we are made one with Christ, we have peace. By holiness of life, we should be made like Christ. Therefore, we experience the peace of God. And that comes after peace with God. So true peace flows from union with Christ. By believing we have peace, by believing we are made one with Christ, and by holiness of life being conformed to the very image of Christ. 
Secondly, true peace flows from subjection to Christ. From subjection to Christ. Where Jesus Christ gives peace, beloved, he sets up his government in the heart. Think about that. We know that the time is going to come when the government of this world shall rest upon the shoulders of Jesus Christ and having the peace that passes all understanding now. Beloved, we look forward to the time when there will be universal peace and there is no hope of universal peace to the individual who does not experience peace with God and the peace of God. But wherever there is peace, Jesus Christ has established his government in the soul of that individual. In other words, he rules there. And he rules in the hearts of those where the peace of God reigns. So true peace flows from subjection to Christ. Therefore, if Jesus Christ be our peace, and he is, as Christians, he is also our prince. He's our ruler. He has the charge of our lives. He has set up government in our hearts. And thirdly, true peace is after trouble. Now, can you take this one? Let's go back and review the first two again before we look at this third proof of what true peace really is. True peace flows, first of all, from union with Christ. Secondly, true peace flows from subjection to Christ. And now, true peace is after trouble. Now, what do you mean by that? The spirit of bondage precedes the spirit of adoption and the spirit of adoption is the spirit that gives peace. Romans chapter 8 and verse 15. So the spirit of, ad of bondage precedes the spirit of adoption. Therefore many say they have peace. But is this peace, let me ask the question now, listen. Is this peace before or after the storm? In other words, when you talk about peace, is your peace the peace before or after the storm? What do you mean by that? I can explain it like this. True peace always comes after trouble. And there can never be any true peace that precedes trouble. So no man can feel sin but by grace. A wicked man is insensible. A life of combat with sin can only come from the life where grace reigns. Galatians 5, verse 17. The conflict between the flesh and the spirit. So peace with God denotes my standing. My standing before God. Yes, the devil may invade my palace, but, beloved, he cannot harm my peace. Do you see what I'm talking about? There isn't a day when you do not have conflict with Satan, and the devil invades your palace every day. But if you have peace with God, Satan can never invade your peace with God. He may invade your palace, but not your peace. So there is peace with God. That refers to my standing, my standing before God. That's why Paul could say, and did say, that we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Being justified by faith, we have peace. And then looking at Philippians chapter 4 and verse 7, the peace of God. This refers to our state before God, not our standing, but our state. As many as walk according to this rule, 
peace be on them. That's not peace with God. It has no reference to peace with God there. But the peace of God, which is a peace not of justification, but the peace of sanctification. Therefore, as many as walk according to this rule, peace be on them. You need to study in connection with this. Galatians 4, 16, 5, 22. And then there's a great text in Isaiah 26 and verse 3, and I'll refer to it briefly. He will keep us in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on him. He'll keep us in perfect peace. This is the peace before God. This has to do to our not standing but to our state. He'll keep us in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on God. Someone has said when Samson had slain the lion, there came honey out of the lion, and by slaying sin, we get the honey of peace, the peace of God. So when our Lord spoke to his disciples, he had many things to say to them in John 14 that would be of comfort to them in view of his departure from their presence. But I think the climax, and I think this is a great climax to the 14th chapter, after he'd said many things about the mansion being prepared for us and Christ coming to receive us unto himself, Jesus Christ being the way, the truth, and the life, no person coming to the Father but by him. And you'll find in the 14th verse, if you ask anything in my name, I'll do it. If you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father that he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. In verse 20, At that day ye shall know that I am in my Father and ye in me and I in you. What comforting words. But the climax of it all when it comes to the last part of the 14th chapter. Peace I leave with you. That's his legacy. My peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth. Give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Nothing can destroy the joy that is the fruit of God's grace. Nothing can destroy the peace with God, which I have, which is the result of my relationship, my standing before Jesus Christ, who is my Savior and my Lord. So here is a legacy and a treasure. The legacy being peace I leave. The treasure being the peace I shall give. Are you at peace? Do you have peace? that passes all understanding. Let us stand as we sing. What's the song?